So welcome everyone to our ongoing study of Bhakti Shastri and we're studying the Bhagavad Gita and we're on chapter 2. So this is, uh, let me see, are you able to see the slideshow? So lesson four today, method of realizing Atma, a review, let's review what we covered, the important points in the previous class. I don't know if I covered all these things but we can look at them today. Alright, so the significance of Sri Bhagavan Uvacha in 2.2. Two. Significance of Sri Bhagavan Uvacha. We see when Lord Krishna speaks, Srila Vyasadeva always puts like that, he always puts Sri Bhagavan Uvacha. He doesn't put Sri Krishna Uvacha, but he puts Sri Bhagavan Uvacha. And the, the reason is, of course, he wants us to appreciate the position of Lord Krishna, that Lord Krishna is different from Arjuna, that he is Bhagavan, he possesses the opulences. The six opulences which are given to us, wealth, beauty, fame, knowledge, strength and renunciation. So no one has any of these qualities equal to Lord Krishna and certainly not greater than Krishna. And so this is the significance of Sri Bhagavan Vacha, to make the distinction between the Supreme Lord speaking and Arjuna speaking, who is a, Arjuna being the, the Jiva. Then, second point, discussed how general principles drawn from Arjuna's dilemma and surrender to Krishna and their relevance to our own practice of Krishna consciousness. So, Arjuna's dilemma was, of course, due to his bodily consciousness, his attachment to the relatives and his... Uh, confusion about what is actually the principles of religion. So this was the, the cause of Arjuna's dilemma and brought about his surrender to Krishna. And relevance to our own practice of Krishna consciousness, sometimes get confused, we become bewildered because of similar reasons that uh, miserly weakness due to the attachment to the body and things in relation to the body. Third point, the concept of individuality of the soul, both in conditioned and liberated states. So this was stated in verse number 12. Never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future will any of us cease to be. So, Lord Krishna is explaining the individuality of the soul, that we're all eternally individuals. We exist as individuals now, we were individuals in the past and we will be so in the future. And whether we're, well, now we're conditioned souls and if we become liberated souls, in the liberated condition there is still the individuality of the soul going back to Godhead does not mean you lose your individuality but some people have, have a fear of, in, of that individuality. They think because I'm a person now if I have to be a person in the liberated state then there will be suffering also. But we should understand in the liberated state there's no suffering. Alright then the fourth point 
arguments to defeat Mayavadi concepts of souls merging after liberation. The soul merging after liberation. The soul leaves the material body, enters into the, the spiritual existence. Now some souls may enter into the spiritual planets where they will manifest a spiritual body and they will en en engage in the different loving exchanges with all the devotees there. And other souls may enter into the impersonal Brahma Jyoti. But although they may enter into the impersonal Brahma Jyoti, they still keep their individuality. Although there's a conception of merging, they're still individuals. And they can also fall down from that position also. They can fall back into the material world. So arguments to defeat this Mayavadi concept, we give the argument that uh, a plane takes off, it, it, it doesn't keep flying. At a certain point it's going to land somewhere. And so similarly the souls, they're, they're entering, they're, they're leaving the material realm, they, they have to go somewhere, where are they going to go? They don't just simply merge, airplanes don't just simply merge and, and lose their individuality. They may crash, that's a different thing, but still they, they exist. So the Mayavari concept of merging, uh, one example which Prabhupada gives, he talks about the green bird entering into the green t tree. It's especially visible in Vrindavan. In Vrindavan there are many green colored parrots and you can see them flying into the green tree. And when they fly into the green tree it appears like they've merged into the tree. But of course they still have their individuality. And as soon as you make a loud sound, bang or something, then the birds will all come flying out of the tree. So this concept of merging after liberation, that is theoretical and it's not factual. Then the fifth point was about, oh, is it the fifth point? Yeah, the pro process of transmigration, we change the body, uh, changing the body compared just like in, in, the, in the course of our life we change from childhood to youth to old age. And so similarly at the end of the body, end of the life of the body, we give up one body, we take another body. And the, 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 the important factor is the consciousness which we have at the end of life. It will determine the type of body we're going to take in the next life. And then finally we spoke about tolerance because it's so hot just now. Of course this is uh, the time of, I, I, I think, we're, no, maybe it's finished now with Nishinga Chaturasi, the Chandan Yatra ends, I think. But the, the very hot time of the year is still very hot here in uh, Asia, still very hot the rains haven't really come. So we have to tolerate. And how to develop that tolerance, practical ways to achieve tolerance? Well, by chanting Hare Krishna, chanting very consciously, very carefully, absorbing our mind in the holy name is the best way to achieve tolerance. Also cultivating spiritual knowledge to help us to control the mind because our, in, our intolerance comes about due to the uncontrolled mind. So if we learn to control the mind, either by cultivating spiritual knowledge or by chanting Hare Krishna, then we can achieve this kind of tolerance. Are there any questions on these points? Anybody wants to ask anything or share anything?
Okay, no questions. So we'll go ahead. We're hearing about how Lord Krishna is defeating Arjuna's arguments against taking part in the battle. One of Arjuna's arguments for not fighting was compassion. So Lord Krishna defeats this argument by presenting the knowledge of the soul. This is shown here. We've simply put jnana. And the jnana, of course, is the jnana of the, the difference between the body and the soul. And it comes up here in text 11 up to text 30. Now, in the previous class, I remember we gave some homework. Have you all done the homework? We asked you, we gave each group a number of verses and we wanted you to pick out some of the important characteristics of the soul and distinct how we can distinguish the soul from the body. All right, so who was in the first group? Some are in the groups, usually we form the meeting and so on. So what? When we come to the Zoom meetings only we have breakout groups and all. There were uh, no separate groups formed by this. They would have uh, studied separately, individually. Okay, then you have to do it now. Okay, Maharaj, I will form the breakout group. So we time for this. Well, what the the there we have to divide the verses among the groups. All right. So we'll have like uh, six groups, five six. people. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we have like twenty verses. Each group can take. Uh, or we can have five groups of uh, six people murdered and then we can have four verses distributed in each group. Then four verses each, is it? Yeah, yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, you can try that. Okay, so group one will deal with text 11, 12, 13 and 14. Right? Group 1, 11 to 14. Group 2, 15, 16, 17 and 18. Group 3, 19, 20, 21 and 22. And then group, group 4, uh, 23, 24, 25, 26. And group 5, 27, 28, 29, 30. All right? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, what is the time, Maharaj, for this? Well, no more than, uh, should be 15 minutes maximum. Okay. And we want to know the characteristics, nature of the soul, and how to distinguish the soul from the body. Make a list, a list of points. I don't want to hear you just speak your, what you think and like this. Just read off the points. When you come, when the spokesman comes forward, he just reads off one, two, three, like that.
Yes, Hare Krishna. Is everyone back from the rooms? Yes, ma'am. 34 members are there. All right. So the people who came late, that's just their problem. We don't have to worry about that. Let's hear from a spokesman from group number one. We we'll want to hear the main points about the characteristic of the soul based on text 11 to 14. How many points do you have? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandapra. My name is Prabhu, I have all the names here. I don't need all the names. I've got everything in front of me. I can see everybody who's in each group. So, Maharaj actually, from verse number 2.11. Huh? From verse number 11 to verse number 2.14, we have the points noted down. From verse number 2.11, the body is born and is destined to be banished to the earth. Can you, can you do something about your microphone? Yes, Maharaj. I just want to know the points. I'm not interested in anything. Just tell me the points. So the body is not as important as the soul. This is point number one from verse number two point eleven. From two point twelve, uh, the eternity of the soul is explained. It's uh, not clear. Your voice is not clear. Acharya, can I ask? Yes, yes, I like that. So, Maharaj, there are uh, three to four characteristics of soul that we found from these verses. One is, the soul is important, not the body. The soul is eternal. It is non-changeable. Okay. And it is individual. So, okay. these four points we got. Okay. That's all you got from those verses, huh? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, thank you. Let's hear from group number two. Okay, so I'm spokesman for group number two, um, theme, and the, um, the characteristics uh, of the soul, um, we had tolerance. What? The soul does not tolerance. Tolerance? Yes, Maharaj. Tolerance is a quality of the soul? I think in that, well, it enables, um, it enables tolerance in the person and, and it depends how you perceive it, but I think, you know, the body, the body isn't tolerant. Well, it's not trained to be tolerant. Mm. I don't, this is something new to me. Usually, I've never heard of the soul being described as tolerant before. Anyway. Okay, okay so, um, other point, the soul does not change, whereas it is eternal, whereas the body changes with time, when you see the uh, physical changes in, in the body as we get older. Yes. The soul pervades throughout the body, the soul pervades throughout the body. Well, we have the, the, the energy uh, of the soul. Okay, the energy, um, that's from text 17. And again, from text 18, the, um, uh, it's again referring to the, the nature of the soul being eternal, and the body not being eternal. Okay. Is that it? Yes, yes, Marge. Okay. Let's hear group, group number three. And from group two. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Um, some characteristics of the soul. We have indestructible, eternal, unborn, ever existing and primeval. Yes. And a difference um, from the soul to the body is that the soul is not slain when the body is slain. Yes. The soul does not have 
any byproduct, unlike the body, for example, like children. The soul is independent, where the body depends on the soul. And the soul is full of knowledge, unlike the body. And the soul remains the same, where the body changes from boyhood to youth to old age. Okay, thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Group number four. Hare Krishna, everybody. Uh, the soul cannot be cut into pieces in, by weapons. It cannot be burned by fire. It cannot be moistened by water. It cannot be withered by air. Soul is unbreakable and insoluble. Soul cannot be burnt or dried. Soul Can, is cannot never be what? Soul cannot be burnt or dried. Oh, burned. With a, All right. Soul is everlasting. Soul is present everywhere. Soul is unchangeable and eternal. Can we say, it's, when you say soul is present everywhere, shouldn't we say souls are present everywhere? I mean, okay. if you say soul, that one soul, you're in that one soul, of course the super soul is all pervading, but to right. say soul is present, you know, that's a little misleading, I think. Okay. You could say souls, souls are present everywhere. It's invisible to material eyes, it's in inconceivable to uh, senses, it's immutable, it's neither born Inconceivable and it never... to senses. Well. Inconce inconceivable to senses. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know about that. Isn't it, well, how do we ever become self-realized? Yeah, correct, Prabhuji. Yeah, because uh, yeah, we can sense it through our mind that there is something that exists beyond senses. But it doesn't sense, Mother. It says it's inconceivable. But anyway. This is, yeah, this is from Sloka 24. No, 25. It is 25. Achintya. Inconceivable. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. It's inconceivable. Right. And Maharaj, after this, maybe we want the difference between what is Thanu, what is Ajala, and what is the difference between Avakaryu. Because they appear to be very, uh, almost a similar meaning, but we are not able to understand. What, 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 what are the words again? Achala, Stanuhu, Avikaryo. These are from, uh, coming from the slokas 24 and 25. We want a little more elaborate explanation. From you. But what, what's the translation given for these words? Stanuhu. Achala is... Yeah, well, go ahead. Yeah, Stanu is unchangeable. Achala is immovable. Uh, Avikarya is again unchangeable. Okay. So unchangeable. And well, that's fair enough. It, it, you know, the body changes. We know the body goes through the changes with the course of time. But the soul is transcendental to time. The soul doesn't age. The soul is eternal. So it's unchangeable. But Maharaj, our question pro, I mean, prominently is on the word achala. Achala is immovable. But for transmigration, it has to move from one body to other. Right? Well, it's immovable, yes. Immovable in the sense that, you know, it's located in the soul. It, it, it doesn't move out of the soul. But, uh, but it doesn't move out of the heart, right? The soul is in the heart. So long as the heart's functioning, so long as the body's alive, the soul will be there. It's not. But even if it, even if you do the heart transplant, the soul the soul is just going to change the seat. It's going to stay in the same body. But after death, Maharaj. 
Well, of course, after death, then it's going to give up because the body's dead, so the soul will leave and take another body. Yes. And this yeah, immovable will uh, be affected. So when it's unchangeable, it just means that the location in which it's situated in that particular body. But when the body's dead, then it will give up that body or take residence in another body. Unchangeable, as I understand from the commentaries, means fixed in form. It does not change its spiritual form. Yes, we said, but we said that. And immovable means fixed in qualities. Whatever characteristics we are reading now between different groups now in this exercise, the soul maintains those qualities, therefore it is called immovable. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. All right, thank you for that. It could be understood, maybe it's just Prabhupada's translation which is confusing the particular meaning. Generally, when we think of something as being unchangeable, and what, what, what's the Sanskrit word? Achala is the word, Maharaj, which we have a doubt actually. Achala is immovable. At least Tanuhu we understand that it is Sachidananda and it doesn't change in its quality. But Achala, which is immovable, we have a doubt. Wow. I mean, if it is related to, yeah, we understand. It's fixed in qualities and I think there was another one where Mataji asked for inconceivable. Inconceivable, if Mataji can understand Hindi, the simple meaning is Samaj Se Bahar, outside of our perception. Hare Krishna. All right. Yes, definitely outside of our uh, mental perception. Yeah, inconceivable we understand, Maharaj. Inconceivable we understand. Uh -huh. uh, with our present mind and whatever we have intelligent, we cannot understand. Okay. But this, this quality of achala, achala is immovable. If it is very related to the heart where it stays, then we understand. But if it is different, then we want to have an understanding. Hare Krishna Maharaj, can we, un uh, can, I mean, uh, I just want to think aloud. Um, immovable, even when it is uh, moving from one body to another, it doesn't move on its own, but it is carried by the subtle body, isn't it? Generally, so, yes, that's how we understand it, this okay. subtle body. So, so even if, it, if the soul is immovable, it still is moving because the subtle body is carrying it. So, is that a well, it could also be, yeah, you know, whether or not the, so, the subtle body is carrying the soul or the soul is carrying the subtle body. I don't know. I, I'm not quite sure how it works. It could also be that with the death of the body, the soul leaves, and at that time the subtle body accompanies the soul. I mean, I don't, have you actually read somewhere where it's described that the this, this subtle body carries the soul? Uh, yes, Maharaj, in Prabhupada's books only, just, he gives the analogy as uh, just like uh, the air carries the fragrance of a flower yes. uh, from one place to another, so uh -huh. the subtle body carries the soul from one body to another. Oh, okay, well okay yeah, good. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a nice understanding. And it, certainly that example was given, the air, as the air carries the aroma. So you could, we could also apply it in, in that sense that the subtle body is carrying the soul. That's a nice realization. Okay. Yeah. But again, probably this question is still there, Maharaj, it, it moves actually. Either way, it moves from one body to other. Right? The transmigration happens. Probably we can get back to this uh, question, Maharaj, after completing the fifth room. They probably are waiting for them to present their points. All right. Yes. So let's go ahead. I, I can add one thing. The achala is the word. Uh, achala comes from the word chala. Chala means walking. The object is walking on its on itself, so that becomes achala. Meaning, soul doesn't move by itself inside the body. 
yes, it moves from one body to another depending on the karma. And, uh, and uh, like the Matari said, Prabhupada said, uh, carried out, carried by, um, uh, by the subtle body. Yeah, it, it, it moves, it doesn't move by itself, but it transforms from one body to another body. But achala means walking by itself from one place to another place inside the body. Once again, achala means it does not add or subtract anything. Therefore, it stays fixed in the qualities. Hare Krishna. Yeah, I agree. All right. Probably that is avikarya, Prabhu. That is avikarya. Vikar, it doesn't go under word. Vikar, vikar is unchanged actually. Adding or subtracting is a change. Vikar. That is unchangeable. Means fixed in its form. The form is fixed. Yes. We agree to that. Okay. Um, the representative from uh, room 5. Uh, yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj, that was for now. So, um, so I just uh, present the points alone. The soul exists even during the unmanifested state and the soul, uh, I mean the body, uh, sometimes it's manifest and sometimes unmanifest. And uh, the soul is eternal and soul is immortal and body is temporary and the soul does not change but the body keeps changing the uh, soul has no birth and death body has birth and death and the body is perishable and the soul is not perishable uh, the soul is amazing and cannot be understood as easily and uh, the soul is minute in size so these are the few points which uh, uh, all of us came up with from the shlokas. Uh, no, all right, thank you, Mandiji. Yes. One more group remaining. No, Maharaj, only we have five groups, five into six. Oh, that's it. That's, okay, very good. All right, so thank you very much for that. Let's go so ahead. On, uh, on the immovable, I have one uh, reflection, if I can present. All right. I was thinking that uh, like we have our organ replacements, we have organ of one person uh, put into other, that way you, a soul cannot move from one uh, uh, person or uh, object to another one. That doesn't happen. It is my soul is mine and other person's soul is that person's soul. That cannot be moved from one uh, human form or any form, uh, material form, to another material form. Maharaj probably explained that, Maharaj. Uh, yes, that was my understanding of the immovable, unmovable. Also, so I agree with you on that, energy. Yes. But uh, there's other ways to understand it also, as we're hearing from some of the devotees today. Okay, interesting. We'll go ahead. Uh, we want to go through these verses about the soul. Text number 21, everyone can read. Vida vinashinam nityam dainam majam avyayam tatam sa purusha parta kam gatayanti hanti kam. O parta, how can a person who knows? that the soul is indestructible, eternal, unborn and immutable, kill anyone or cause anyone to kill. So the soul's nature is described here, again also, indestructible and, and eternal, practically the same thing. Unborn, well, if it's eternal, unborn means without beginning, immutable, it cannot be cut into pieces, like cannot be made, put into small pieces. How can it possibly kill anyone or cause anyone to kill? 
So this is Lord Krishna instructing Arjuna that the soul doesn't kill anyone or cause anyone to kill. Prabhupada says, violence has its utility. Everything has its proper utility and a man who is situated in complete knowledge knows how and where to apply a thing for its proper utility. Similarly, violence also has its utility and how to apply violence rests with the person in knowledge. So this is an issue of course, nowadays we have a lot of uh, people promoting ahimsa, non-violence, you know, with the things like vegan diet, they say it's very violent to take the animal products and so on. So we have to understand that violence actually has its utility. The question is how and where it should it be used. So Prabhupada said it, it rests the, the, on the person in knowledge, those who have knowledge. So we request you, you can quickly just look over Prabhupada's purport to text 21 and 31, two texts, 21 and 31. And we want you to think about when is violence justified and what are current issues of religious violence? Why did Krishna, who is all loving, incite Arjuna to war? Did we discuss that already? Yes, Maharaj, we discussed this last point already. Right, this last point you can forget about, we have that. But the first two points, when is violence justified? Would you like to just take a few minutes to just look through purport 21 and 31? And then we'll come back to you. Yeah, you want it as an individual activity or a group? Yeah, individual. We're going to, dis oh. we'll just discuss. All right, could, could we have some contribution? Yes, Maras. When, when do you think violence is justified? 
when the violence is done for the sake of the dharma, religion, um, and at the supreme, uh, at the su uh, for the supreme object, at the instruction of supreme personality of Godhead, then that violence is justified. Could you give an example? Uh, when Arjuna um, uh, declined to fight uh, Krishna, uh, Lord Krishna uh, instructs him to fight, showing the reasons why you have to fight, and his instruction Arjuna uh, comes back to, uh, uh, to fight back again, just to maintain the religion at that time. Uh huh. Well, you know, can can we get away from Kurukshetra just just for a while, just you know, uh, in terms of current issues, maybe when would violence be justified? Maharaj, uh, can I speak? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Maharaj, I am Shubankar. So one of the uh, uh, time when it is justified suppose you, out of the four orders you are satriya your responsibility is to give protection so, so it is justified if we are giving something for the sake of protection all right you may by the way of giving protection to someone yes you may yes. have to defend them of course in the modern days if you were to do that you may get yourself in trouble with the authorities because you're not you don't have the right to punish people or to attack people depends on whether we are given the authority or not also the military man can shoot uh, the other person in the war and get a award for the same but he cannot come and leave to his place and then shoot the next neighbor saying that I am here to do protection out of his own will and for his own purpose without a higher purpose if he kills even if he is a military man he will be put into jail yeah and uh, the other point uh, another one point on this point is many people say ahimsa is paro, paro, parama dharma no ahimsa is not parama dharma in Bhagavatam it says savai pumsa paro dharma yato bhakti adokshadari Go to the ultimate, then it is the other way around. Yes, certainly this is true that Ahimsa is not the supreme principle of religion. It's a, it's a sub-religious principle. And he, yeah, he, he, he says actually in 13th chapter also, actually, it is one among the uh, Devic qualities in 16th probably or 13th also. Yes. He says these are important but not as much important as doing Bhakti to Supreme Lord. Right. And uh, one more point is that, in, I mean, even in Islam, they say uh, jihad or something. They say, right? When I, uh, I when I was discussing with one of my friends, who is a Muslim, he was saying, meaning that if one comes to you for protection, you should protect him and then you should defend. It is not that you go and bomb somebody. It is not that. That is what he said actually. But actually, it is practice or not is a different thing. Okay, so when is violence justified? We have some examples. Can someone give some, the, what, what examples does Prabhupada give? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Okay. So Prabhupada is giving example of capital punishment. Here. Yes, right. Where, uh, it's, it's good for the murderer also, and it's according to religious principle that if somebody commits a murder, then the king or the government can award capital punishment so that he doesn't have to suffer the reactions in the next life. Right. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes. Any, other, other, any other example was there? Yeah. In medical uh, surgery, right, he really says for operating a person, violence may be required, but that is to cure the person and not to kill the person. Okay. Another example where violence is justified that sometimes there may be some unrest within a kingdom and the government may be forced to send the military or send some uh, force in there to quell the unrest and to bring back law and order 
where there's a disturbance in society and a lo loss of law and order, then the government can go and they can use violence to re-establish law and order. Thank you, Mr. Paras. Another example is uh, animal sacrifice. Okay. Uh, when we when the animal is sacrificed, that, that the atma, the soul, gets a higher Well, body. is that possible in the Kali Yuga? Uh, might be happening, yes, if it is eternal principle, huh? it must be happening, it's eternal. In Kali Yuga, these things are not encouraged, that people cannot chant the mantras properly. Yes, in Kali Yuga, Brahmanas are not that qualified, actually. Right. Prabhuji, uh, um, Violence as in as a self-defense is justified. Sorry? Violence in self-defense. In, in self-defense. Mm. I don't know about what the legal standard standings on that are. Yeah, but it, but it sounds reasonable. Uh, for women, at least in India, it is given by Uh huh. Okay. In women, yes. in India, uh, that is our action. Uh -huh. And also as devotees, you know, what, what should be our mood if we are attacked, you know? Of course, uh, Mad, uh, Madhvacharya was very powerful, right? He, got, he had some issues with some dacoits and thieves. He, he <laughs> beat them up. Defeated them. But we're encouraged to also tur turn the other cheek, right? Someone hits you on one cheek, you turn the other cheek. This is a Christian way. All right, any current issues of religious violence? Yeah, people think that. Uh... <clears throat> in Hindu idols are to be, uh, I mean, destroyed if they want to save their own religion. And recently also in Bangladesh it happened. Last to last, Durga Puja or something. An uh, Iskand devotee was slain. That. Thinking that uh, destroying the Hindu idols will save their own religion, which is appreciable. Okay. And it goes on. Prabhupada also mentions in one of the lectures or purpose, he says, this is uh, ignorance, not religion. Mm -hmm. yeah, destroying, destroying other religious symbols, thinking that it will save their own is, is nothing but ignorance. Yes. Yeah, we get conflicts even among Hindus, like the Shivites against the Vaishnavas that was in the past, in the times of Ramanuja Charya. South India it is very common. Brother. Yeah, in, very in, common. Uh, in deities worship, oh, yeah. there is one place called Gopura Bhatti near Sri Rangam, Muslim invaders came, around 500 plus of 5,000 plus devotees, Vaishnavas, sacrificed their lives to save the media of Ramana. Okay, let's go ahead uh, see what Srila Prabhupada has to say about this. The other side, Duryodhan, why he did not think in that way? Why Arjuna is thinking? Because he is devotee. That is the difference. A devotee thinks like that. A devotee does not like to kill anyone. Even an ant, so many atrocities were done to him still when the question of killing came, he was not very happy. No, this is Vaishnava. He is ready to excuse even the greatest enemy. So, this is the mood of the devotee Vaishnava. He is ready to excuse even the greatest enemy. Prabhupada's lecturing, 126.27. And another quote here from Prabhupada, from the purport, 
of text number 35 in chapter 1. The devotee of the Lord does not retaliate against the wrongdoer, but the Lord does not tolerate any mischief done to the devotee by the miscreants. The Lord can excuse a person on his own account, but he excuses no one who has done harm to his devotees. Therefore, the Lord was determined to kill them who wanted to excuse them. So this is Arjuna's compassion. Another quote here from a lecture by Prabhupada, first chapter, 26 and 27. If you insult his devotee, the devotee may excuse, but Krishna will not excuse. This is Krishna's position. Therefore, be careful, it should be, be careful not to insult a devotee. A devotee may excuse you, but Krishna will not excuse you. Krishna is so strict, he cannot tolerate any insult to his devotee. Therefore, this arrangement of fighting Arjuna wanted. No, let them be excused, Krishna wanted. No, you must fight, you must kill them. <laughs> okay, a bit more. From the purport of text number 31, chapter 2. The Kshatriyas are specially trained for challenging and killing because religious violence is sometimes a necessary factor. Yes, we know that sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes, just like sometimes the deities were threatened so the devotees, of course, they took a lot of trouble to move the deities, to protect the deities. But sometimes it happened that they were not able to avoid the enemy and the enemy came and damaged some deities. So we try to protect. And there's another quote here from chapter 3. Text number 20, Lord Krishna and Arjuna, the Lord's eternal friend, had no need to fight in the battle of Kurukshetra, but they fought to teach people in general that violence is also necessary in a situation where good arguments fail. Before the battle of Kurukshetra, Every effort was made to avoid the war, even by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But the other party was determined to fight. So for such a right cause, there is a necessity for fighting. All right, so that's chapter 3, text number 20, purport. Prabhupada is establishing that there is proper use of violence. And he said, where good arguments fail, then sometimes violence is necessary. Indeed, Haranyakashipu also thought like that. When he was dealing with Prahlad, he was trying to change Prahlad to make him a demon, but he saw he couldn't do it. So he resorted to violence. He wanted to kill Prahlad. Okay. Going ahead, text number 22. We can chant together. Vasam chijarnani yata vihaya navani krenati Naro Parani Tata Shari Rani Vihaya Jirnani Anyani Samyati Navani Dehi 
Okay, translation. As a person puts on new garments, giving up old ones, the soul similarly accepts new material bodies, giving up the old and useless ones. So it's not always old, it's not always that the body is old, but sometimes it, it does become useless, it breaks down. Sometimes even young children get health, serious health problems and their body becomes useless. So at such time it may be that they give up that useless body and go off and take a new body. Sometimes it's the law of karma which arranges like that. So the body is compared to garments. We change the body. So that was 22. And then we jump to 24. You can chant together. Ajedyo yam adayo yam Akledyo shoshaye vacha Nitya sarvagatastano Atalo yam sanatana So here we have this, uh, this achala, this un, 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 immovable Translation, the individual soul is unbreakable and insoluble and can be neither burned nor dried. He is everlasting, present everywhere, unchangeable, immovable and eternally the same. So we have a quote here discussing this Sarva Gata. The word Sarva Gata, all pervading, is significant because there is no doubt that living entities are all over God's creation. They live on the land, in the water, in the air, within the earth and even within fire. The belief that they are sterilized in fire is not acceptable because it is clearly stated here that the soul cannot be burned by fire. Therefore, there is no doubt that there are living entities also in the sun planet with suitable bodies to live there. <coughs> so Prabhupada's purport is bringing out this point. Modern science has proved that at the time of sterilization there are still living entities within the atmosphere. Previously it was thought that with sterilization everything is killed. But later on, with more research, more accurate research, they were able to understand that there are many other things still living there. <coughs> so, Sarvagata, all pervading, within everything. So the nature of the souls described here, it accepts all types of bodies. We get souls in all the 8,400,000 different species of life. It doesn't depend on the body. All bodies have the soul. So examples are given, just like man and the devas, the birds and the beasts one after another, according to karma. So the soul has a particular karma, which is there in the, with the subtle body, 
and the subtle body will arrange for that soul to enter into a particular situation. So it's all, you could say, karma. The karma is dictating the karma from the past. And we have a lot of karma, not just from this life, but from many lives. And not just our own, but it might be our own, uh, our own countrymen, our, our own workers, maybe working in a different company, and the, the friends come and they, the friends are all working in different jobs, and if they give you money, then you share their karma. So we take different bodies according to our karma. This is from Prabhupada's lecture. Prabhupada explains, there are still yogis in India who early in the morning take a bath in four dams, Hardwar, Jagannath Puri, Rameshwaram and Dwarka. Within one hour they'll take a bath in four places. They'll sit down in one place and by the yogic process, within few minutes, will get up and dip in this water. So the spirit soul has so much freedom, sarva gata, to go anywhere he likes. But our impediment is this body which curtails our freedom. <laughs> so Prabhupada is explaining here the soul has some, soul does have freedom, can go anywhere. Problem is our own self that we are attached to the body. Because of our attachment to the body that keeps the soul in the body, keeps us here in the material realm. Someone like to read this for us? So if you can get rid of this material body and be situated in the spiritual body, you may be just like Narad Muni who can move anywhere. He has a spiritual body, he is free to move anywhere, like spacemen who are trying to travel in space by nations. There is no necessity for machines. Uh, Yantra Ruthani Mayaya. The machine is made of Maya, but you have your own power, which is very speedy, but it is being cuddled. Therefore, one should be very careful how to get the soul out of the engagement of this material body. That should be our first concern. Lecture Bhagavad Gita, 2nd chapter, verse number 25, London, 1973. Thank you so much. Very nice. Yes. So, Prabhupada quotes verse from the 18th chapter, Yantra Rudani Mayaya, the, seated on the machine, the Yantra, the machine of the material nature. So, Srila Prabhupada is describing how we can get a spiritual body, and with the spiritual body, then you can travel everywhere. But to get the spiritual body, you have to get rid of karma. You have to nullify all your past reactions. And then that will qualify us for a spiritual body. All right. Someone can read. Krishna argues from different angles. Krishna now begins offering another argument to convince Arjun to take part in the battle. Verse 26 starts with the words Athacha. If, however, which indicates that Krishna will now begin to discuss a new topic. Wait, there's a bit more. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains, 
Krishna's thinking. I have thus far explained these things to you from the viewpoint of Shastra. Now I will explain. Yes. So, text 21 begins with this word, if however, if however. So, Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur explains to us what is happening, that Krishna is explaining things from a different viewpoint, from a worldly point of view. Here we have text number 26, and you see it begins, Atacha, if however, if however, you think that the soul or the symptoms of life are always born and die forever, you still have no reason to lament, O mighty armed. Right? So, this is a worldly viewpoint, the symptoms of life. What are the symptoms of life? Yes, what are the symptoms of life? Birth, death, old age, yeah. disease. The yeah. six changes that happen. Anything else? Any other symptoms of life? Consciousness. Consciousness. What? One person? Consciousness. Birth, growing, recreation. Yes, right. Like that, yeah. Growing and producing byproducts and yes, then dwindling and finally dying, right? Experience of transformation. Yes. So, Lord Krishna is giving this, this, this other viewpoint. If you think the soul is always born and dies forever, then still you have no reason to lament. Why? Because it will anyways die, why do you lament? Yes, because if the soul is always being born and dying, then it's not a problem, right? <laughs> not a big issue. Life is cheap. I think the word used here is dies forever, which means that once the soul dies, it will not take birth again. Won't take neither, birth again, right? Neither for Arjun nor for the Bhishma and others. Ah. Therefore, there's nothing. That is what I understand the meaning is. Yes, right. Definitely. If the soul is always born and dies forever, so Prabhu, Prabhu is making that important point that Lord Krishna is giving this example that the soul may not, you know, gen there's some Buddhists also who talk like that, you know, they present the idea of the soul, but they have a material concept of the soul. Just like here, it's a, a material conception of the soul. Their idea of life is that the soul takes birth and dies, just like the body. So they have material concept of the soul. They don't see the soul as being spiritual, they see it as being material. So Maharaj, here Krishna makes a point of showing you is it so? By, you know, at the end of this life, everything ends, actually. Is it like that? At the end of this life, what? Everything ends. That is what Krishna says, right, here? Yes. Yeah, yeah so it is like a negative uh, explanation of this. Yes. Yeah. This, is, this, all, this is a Buddhist philosophy, Buddhism idea, like that. They, they talk about the soul, but they don't apply the soul as being spiritual, they simply understand it as material. So K Krishna says to Arjuna, well if you think like that Arjuna, there's no reason to lament. 
Because there's no mean, there's no significance to life anymore. Life has no purpose. All right, we'll take a break. We have to have a break. Looks like in the Vaibhasika philosophy, the soul always vanishes with the deterioration. Right, yes. Good. Okay, we'll have a break. Was it how many minutes? Five minutes, is it? Okay. Okay, well. Okay, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, we're back again. So, we were discussing this point, different ways of presenting the soul. We saw Arjuna, uh, Lord Krishna give a material example of the soul. But here you see, Krishna first explained the soul's eternality. Now, for the sake of completeness, he argues on the basis of principles presented by other philosophers, namely atheists and Buddhists. Right? The atheists, Buddhism is a type of atheistic philosophy. Buddhists, they don't talk about God. They will never talk about God. They don't think of Buddha as God. He's Buddha. <laughs> and you can also, the goal is to become a Buddha also. Everyone should become a Buddha. That's the Buddhist. And the atheists, of course, they say there's no God also. And so they present the material understanding of the soul. That the soul uh, the begin it takes it uh, begins and, and it ends it's, it's, it has a beginning and an end like the body so if all the assembled warriors are factually eternal souls there is no reason for lamentation because no one will die on the battlefield but if Arjuna accepts the argument for the non-existence of the soul, then he should not be afraid to fight. After all, how can he be a killer of a combination of chemicals? <laughs> all right. Can you understand the point here? Arjuna accepts the argument of the non-existence of the soul. So if there's no existence of the soul, there's nothing spiritual there. So the body is just chemicals. So Arjuna is just killing some bag of chemicals. So not a cause of, there's nothing, no reason to lament. And in the beginning, if we accept that everyone is a spirit soul, then there's no reason to lament also. Because for the soul, there's no, there's no death. So in this way, whether the soul exists or not, Arjuna should not lament, but he should fight. So this way, Lord Krishna is encouraging Arjuna to fight. Can someone read for us? So in any case, whether Arjuna accepts it or not, the soul Thank you, Prabhu. All right, so Prabhupada's conclusion is very clear. Whether you accept the existence of the soul or not, 
there was no reason for Arjuna not to fight. If the soul exists, then this, no one's going to die because the soul is eternal, cannot be killed. And if the soul, if we accept that, or if we accept that there's no soul, or that the, that the soul is material, then because it means that every living entity is just simply some combination of chemicals. And we're all taking birth and dying anyway. So it's not a big problem. Everyone's in that situation. There's no question of rebirth. We're all just some chemicals. We're just some um, manifestation of the material nature. So the material nature undergoes transformation. And the body also is part of that material nature. So that, that's the philosophy known as the Vaibhashikas. So it's not Vedic, it's not the Vedic understanding. So then it continues, text number 27. We can chant together. Jatasya hi dhruva mrityur dhruvam janma mritasya cha tasmad parihari te natvam sochitam arhasi Translation, someone read? Read the translation. All right, so this is a, powerf a powerful verse, nice to quote. One who's taken birth, we're all going to die. Prabhupada would often say, the death rate is the same as always been. What is the death rate? Yes, 100%, right, 100%, everyone's going to die, as sure as death. But after death, one is sure to take birth again. So this is a fact. So Lord Krishna is therefore encouraging Arjuna, do your duty, don't lament, don't avoid doing your duty. No re nothing to lament about. Someone read Prabhupada's purport. Srila Prabhupada's purport. One has to take birth according to one's activities of life, and after finishing one term of activity, one has to die to take birth for the next. In this way, one is going through one cycle of birth and death after another without liberation. This cycle of birth and death does not, however, support unnecessary murder, slaughter and war. But at the same time, violence and war are inevitable factors in human society for keeping law and order. Thank you, Madam. Keep reading. The battle of Kurukshetra, being the will of the Supreme, was an inevitable event, and to fight for the right cause is the duty of a Kshatriya. Why should Arjuna be afraid or, or aggrieved at, this, at the death of his relative, since he was discharged, discharging his proper duty? He did not deserve to break the law, thereby becoming subjected to the reactions of sinful acts, of which he was uh, so afraid. By avoiding the discharge of his proper duty, he would not be able to stop the death of his relative, and he would be degraded due to his selection of the wrong path of action. Yes. Point. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Mother. Thank you, Mary Thank you. Yes. So, <laughs> Prabhupada writes uh, about Arjuna's situation that he, he, he didn't deserve to break the law. He didn't deserve but if he doesn't fight, 
he's going to break the law. That's a fact. The law is there. That he was actually meant to fight. It's for the, the right cause and it's a duty of the Kshatriya. When they're called to battle, it's their duty to go to fight. So there was nothing for Arjuna to be afraid. But Arjuna is not afraid for his body, but he, he's afraid of the religious principles. He wants to do it to do what is proper according to the religious principles. So Lord Krishna is pointing out the importance of performing his proper duty. What is his proper duty? Now Arjuna was thinking that if he didn't fight, he could stop the death of his relatives. But Lord Krishna says, no, they're all going to die anyway. We just heard, Jatashyahi dhruva mrityu dhruvam janma mritash. Everyone's going to die. So the relatives of Arjuna are also going to die. You cannot avoid it. Whether you fight or not, they're all going to die. So Lord Krishna wants to encourage Arjuna to follow, to do his duty. Then text number 28, can we all chant together again? Dadini Bhutani Vyak Madhyani Bharata Abhyakta Nidanani Eva Tatra Kapari Devana Translation All created beings are unmanifest in their beginning, manifest in their interim state and unmanifest again when annihilated. So what need is there for lamentation? So this is true for everyone, all created beings. In the beginning, unmanifest. Later on, manifest and then again, unmanifest. Just the, the change of the external feature but there's no reason for lamentation Prabhupada's purport who would like to read for us please the material body has not a factual experience in relation to the eternal soul it is something like a dream in a dream we will think or fly in the sky or sitting on a chair as a king but when we wake up, we can see that we are neither in the sky nor seated on the chair. The Vedic wisdom encourages self-realization on the basis of the non-existence of the material body. Therefore, in ASI debate, whether no one believes in the experience of the soul or one does not believe in the experience of the soul, the body. Okay, so that's Prabhupada's purport on this text number 28. Vedic wisdom encourages us, encourages self-realization based on the non-existence of the material body. Of course, the material body is temporary. So it, it, it's, not, it's not real, you could say, because it... it it's just a temporary manifestation, a temporary covering of the soul. So it's not real. Okay. Yes, Rishikesh has a question, a point. Yes. Sorry, I was actually uh, planning to ask question on verse 27, one before. Uh -huh. Just a small clarification here. When we look at the verse, we are looking at Yatasahi Dhrum, which is Dhrum Yenindrasiddha, means the birth and death. That cycle is unavoidable. What is born is bound to die. It's that which is unavoidable. But when we read the translation, it says 
One was taken as the, in the unavoidable discharge. Well, Arjuna's duty is unavoidable in the sense that he's obligated. He's supposed to do that. He's supposed to take part in that battle. The word Papri Hariye, when the Prabhupada has translated, of that which is unavoidable, which 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 pertains to or is related to the birth and death. It's that part which is unavoidable. So whether Arjun does his duty or not, they will be birth, they will be death. So he might as well do his duty. It's not unavoidable duty, but he has to do his duty. To, to my understanding, please clarify. Maybe I'm getting it wrong, but see, it is him to discharge his duty as a Kshatriya. Uh -huh. Of birth and death is unavoidable. Yes. All right. Well, the birth and death is certainly unavoidable. That's for, there's no question of that. But yes. we, we, the discharge of his duty also goes goes along with that. Yes, but the way I'm, I'm looking at the translation, it tends to give a slightly different off the rails meaning. It says it's the discharge of duty which is unavoidable <laughs> rather I thought the stress is more on the birth and death which is unavoidable well of course birth and death is unavoidable there's no need for discussion on that yes. Arjuna and Lord Krishna is not going to make I don't think Lord Krishna is going to talk about that being unavoidable but uh, although we, avoid it was just mentioned in the previous verse yes Oh, oh no, this verse, of course, this verse, 27, Jatashe, yeah, that birth and death is unavoidable. So the birth and death is unavoidable. Okay. And also, the, the discharge of his duty is also something unavoidable. Because he, everyone has forced to act helplessly. You know, it will be stated later on that we're all, we're all going to act. Nobody can be idle. I agree. 3.5 does say, Nahi Prasit Chanapi Gapati says, Yes, we are forced to act helplessly, but in this particular case, if Arjun so insistently wanted, he could have gone for begging, although it won't suit his character as a, as a Kshatriya. Agreed. But he could have avoided his duty if he so wanted to. So it's not an unavoidable duty, it's the unavoidable the other part. Mm -hmm. Unavoidable birth and death. That's what I understood, Mother. I'm trying to clarify this. Well, uh, I don't know. I mean, this is something I'd have to discuss. You'd have to discuss this with Jayadweda Swami, who had edited this. You know, he's the editor, really, of, of this, this book. And he did make he did make some changes because there were there were mistakes in it, and so he did make some changes and he got a lot of criticism because people would say you know you're you're changing Prabhupada's words you see, <laughs> and so uh, he actually I heard from Jayadwira Swami he said there's other things in the Bhagavad Gita which needed to be changed but he got so much criticism for changing some of the words of the Bhagavad Gita. People, you know, some of our devotees are very sentimental and they don't like to change Prabhupada's words. Although Prabhupada did give a lot of freedom to the editors that they could improve his rendering of different points. So th this is something which, you know, this is really an editorial point, you know. Certainly unavoidable discharge of duty. 
Now you're picking it up from the word, you're taking from the word meaning that what's unavoidable is actually birth and death. Yes, my Lord. Uh -huh. So, I mean, this, this is some point which it, you may be right, you know, I mean, it certainly sounds like you're, you're right, but we'd have to discuss with the editors what they think about this. And you can also check what the other Acharyas say. How does uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and Baladeva Vijabhusan translate this verse? But they have mentioned that if birth and death is sure to happen, it is unavoidable. Therefore, uh, in the discharge, they have not used the word unavoidable. Ah, they didn't the use the word unavoidable. You should it's not claim it while doing your duty. Yes, okay. Hi Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, actually, I have the original edition of Bhagavad Gita as it is. So, uh, it, it, the translation is said here that for one who has taken his birth, death is certain, and for one who is dead, birth is certain. Therefore, in the unavoidable discharge of your duties, you should not lament. This is the original edition of Bhagavad Gita as it is. I have that. Uh, uh, so, I think it is the actual uh, translation. Uh, of Srila Prabhupada and uh, I would like to mention here that this unavoidable this particular word it is actually it has been uh, uh, spoken by Lord Sri Krishna so Krishna stressed here uh, the unavoidable word in case of duty because he wanted Arjuna to fight because Arjuna was that time bewildered because of bodily concept of life and uh, he actually didn't understand what what to do, what is his actual duty. So for that particular reason, Lord Krishna stressed here that I am here and I am here to help you. Uh, and uh, you must fight in this regard. You should not lament for bodily concepts of life and for your attachment to your relatives. So this is unavoidable discharge. So as we have already discussed that uh, what is the actual uh, uh, actual for meaning of violence or in case of religious violence. So whatever Krishna said, it is actually unavoidable. And Krishna wanted Arjuna to fight. And that is, I think, as unavoidable. No, very good. Very nice, Mataji. Thank you very much for this argument. Yes. Uh, what do you, wh how do you, did you, did you hear all that, Prabhu? What do you think? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mataji, for that. And from all Krishna further says that, Matir Mama, Matir Mama, this is my opinion, this is my opinion. Okay. So yes, Prabhu, that is what I wanted to say. It is Krishna's okay. opinion. Can I finish, Mataji? Yes, please. Maharaj. Yes, yes. Okay. So, there are two Acharyas who are superior to us who have interpreted it not as unavoidable duty, but while discharging, you should not lament while doing your duty. And the unavoidable part has been correctly interpreted by them to say that birth and death is unavoidable. For us to push the point that Krishna wanted that this is an unavoidable duty, Krishna, if that was the case, he would have just spoken one word. This is an unavoidable duty, do it. Rather, Krishna is convincing Arjun through various ways. He is putting that effort to draw into Arjun that, look, you should fight. This suits you. But, uh, uh, yes. I think uh, the unavoidable part so far is just in everything in the first part also, the last couple of lines, uh, where like we as a current generation we can say duties are avoidable, but uh, Prabhupada is writing why duties, duties cannot be avoided, there is sinful reaction to it, <coughs> so that's what Prabhupada has elaborated with the first part also. And if Arjun wants to take the sinful reaction, that's fine for him, that's up to him. Uh, but uh, I, I would actually uh, go with Rishikesh go at this point because the context is actually explaining on the repetition of birth and death. If you go to the 26th sloka, there also Krishna says about uh, if even if you think, actually Atha he says, even if you think that uh, soul is actually dying, actually, okay, even if you think it's soul and its symptom is always born and dying. So he's only talking about birth and death here. He doesn't, and uh, as Vishnu Chakravarti 
Thakur says, uh, Maharaj has been shown as well. He says that he starts a new topic. And in 26, he starts a new topic, and in 27, he doesn't directly go to another topic, I guess. Thank you, Prabhu. And I, if Prabhu, I think, uh, quoted the last part of the purport. Let me read it for everyone's benefit. Prabhupada says, by avoiding the discharge of his proper duty, he doesn't say unavoidable duty, by avoiding the discharge of his proper duty, he would not be able to stop the death of his relatives. And that is unavoidable. All right. Okay, I, thank you. I think we spent enough time on this discussion. Uh, we have uh, two more hands raised. <laughs> well, is it... We lost Padmanath Prabhu. He was uh, raising a hand for long, actually. Really? Okay. We lost Padmanath Prabhu. Sorry for that. Can you speak? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I just... Uh, I got it more clarified from the discussion, so nothing more to add. Okay. okay, Prabhu, thank you. And uh, Shantanda Prabhu. Okay, I uh, understand uh, this one, uh, as it says in the Slotos, you know, the birth and death cycle is one aspect. The other one is, um, you know, going to go, uh, going to go fighting. Uh, it's all available. Can I, can I bring the sloko back again? This, uh, yeah, that's why. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. There are two issues here. The, the death and the uh, birth and death is a must. Nobody can avoid that. Second issue here is this, uh, um, duty. And the duty as a Kshutriya, you have to go out to the fight. As the discussion of the Lord. So that cannot be absolutely either. So I I I interpret it this way. This on our world relates to this side of your duty, not the birth and cycle. Birth and birth and death cycle is is a is a is the baseline. Now we are talking about the duty of fighting and if he has to uh, I has to discharge that he cannot avoid that. Whatever reason he gives, doesn't matter. Whether birth or death and his lamentation, all are very much, uh, you know, very much uh, logical and very much, uh, um, you know, you know, his support. But at the same time, his uh, duty, uh, to discharge the duty of Kitriya is unavoidable. He cannot be avoided. That's how I read this. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. So, an interesting discussion. We thank you all for the very nice participation in this. Certainly, there's two sides to it. Rishikesh Prabhu has his vision on it. Let's go ahead. Uh, here, text number 28. What needs is okay. Did we read this purport? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, right. Okay, so we're up to 29. Let's read the text. Ascharyavad pasyati kascadinam Ascharyavad vadati tataiva chanya Ascharyavad chainam manya shrinoti Shudva enam vedana chaiva kascad Some look on the soul as amazing, some describe him as amazing, and some hear of him as amazing, while others, even after hearing about him, cannot understand him at all. So the soul is described as amazing. And then, of course, there are others also, they cannot understand the soul at all. So we're hearing about these kind of people. Even after hearing about him, they cannot understand him at all. Unfortunate fellows, but Lord Krishna does describe how some people they find the soul amazing and they describe him as amazing and they hear of him as amazing. So, quite contrast. 
Ascharya Vat, because of the astonishing Ascharya Vat nature of the soul, it is a very difficult subject matter to grasp. Therefore, in spite of being exhaustively explained by Krishna in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, people understand it in completely different ways. Thus, varieties of philosophies appeared due to different misunderstandings about the nature of the soul. Certainly, we know there's a lot of different misunderstandings about the nature of the soul. People do understand it in many different ways. Maharaj, we have Yuvati Sachi Mataji raising. Yuvati Sachi, but she's not in the class, is she? Is she, yeah. one, of, is she one of the students in this class? Uh, they are guest participants, Maharaj. No, no, we don't take questions from the guests. The guests can hear, they cannot participate. Okay. And Vilas Padma Prabhu can. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, from this sloka, I am getting understanding that the different philosophies or the different cult we see. And the root reason is the basic misunderstanding or different understanding about the soul. Is it what you were telling Madhav that because of this only different uh, people have different uh, cult and different practices? Yes, definitely. We certainly know that this is true, that there are different opinions, different ideas about the soul. And uh, Maharaj, there is one more interpretation on this sloka which says that uh, uh, who talk about uh, soul are amazing and who describe about him are amazing and who hear about them are amazing because they are very rare. <laughs> yes. Because they are very rare uh, and that, that is one way of looking at it also. I heard some of yeah, those, those people are amazing. Not that the soul is amazing, but those people are amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Yes, it's a good... It's interesting. Certainly, the Sanskrit language is like that. It can be understood in different ways. And that's why you have so many different editions of the Bhagavad Gita. Of course, that's not the only reason. Of course... Other people, many people are just rascals and they take advantage of the Bhagavad Gita to present their own philosophy. Okay, so let's go ahead here. We're advised to read Surrender Unto Me and you get more in interesting insights onto this. Would someone like to read Prabhupada's purport here to text 29? It is very difficult to find a man who perfectly understands the position of the super soul, the atomic soul, their respective functions and relationship, and all other measured mind and details. And it is still more difficult to find a man who has actually derived full benefit from the knowledge of the soul. In the and system of Varnashna, we have our modernized version of Varnashram. Adik Prabhuji, can I share uh, my understanding? Yeah. Uh, here it says in the last paragraph, discharging of one's specific duty in any field of action in accordance with orders of higher authorities serves to elevate one to higher status of life. Right? It will only take to the higher status of life. That's the one thing I want to bring it. And in uh, Sloka 18.66, which we are all familiar with, Sarva Dharma Paritya, where Krishna says that Moksha uh, Sami Masuchai, there he says that I will give you Moksha. But this, putting these two together, my understanding is discharging one's duty makes you qualify 
to a higher status uh, in a higher conscious level but taking to the path of uh, devotion gives you the moksha in the same line yes right you can go very quickly in devotion but you go by Varnashram would take you a long time Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mataji, just a quick clarification. When you read the last line of the purport, and the very last word says, elevate one to the to a higher status of life by other acharyas, that of life means of material life. It does not say it is going to take you straight to spiritual. Yes, there's a verse in Bhagavatam 1 to 13. The last words are Samsudhir Hai Toshanam. This Varnashtam Dharma is only to please the Lord, jump into the pure devotional service. Once the Lord is pleased, yes. It's something similar. A person in Krishna consciousness is, however, is above even the Brahmanas. So, the step by step Varnashtam only brings you up to the Brahmana, but one in Krishna consciousness is higher. And that position can be achieved at any stage. We don't have to go step by step. Hare Krishna. Yes, but I would like to add that not everyone's able to take up devotional service. And this was why Prabhupada said we had to introduce Varnashram. Because Prabhupada did see many devotees had difficulties trying to keep up the standards of devotional service. To actually perform devotional service is very challenging for a lot of people. It's not an easy thing. And we speak about it in a very light way that, oh yes, devotional service is, is certainly the, the best thing, but it's not possible for everyone. There are, it's only a few souls who are able to actually take it up and maintain it. And Maharaj, to add what you are saying, like uh, you said, right, uh, it will avoid uh, it will bring certain amount of purity nowadays previously we were saying that westerners or the uh, other world i mean the, yeah other part of the world is sinful but nowadays in, even in india all the four uh, pillars of religion are smashed actually but i mean that we have a OBA on this probably <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah. i want to get clarity on that that is why i wanted to have a discussion on okay that. okay so we, we, have, we have had some discussion on it. Let's go ahead. Uh, so Prabhupada said, both ways you have to fight. Both ways you have to fight. Krishna is trying to put Arjuna in the dilemma. This way or that way, you must have to fight. If you think that you are not in bodily concept of life, then it is my order. You must fight. If you think that you are in bodily concept of life, then you are a Kshatriya. You must fight. Both ways you have to fight. This is Krishna's conclusion. Hmm. So both, first of all, if you think that you are not in bodily concept, in other words, if you are the liberated soul, then you have to carry out the order of Krishna because Krishna is ordering. It is my order, Krishna is saying to Arjuna, you must do it. And if you're not on that, on that level, if you're in the bodily concept of life, then you are a Kshatriya, you're doing Varnashram and you must fight both ways. Conclusive statement. That's Bhagavad Gita 2.31. So Krishna has defeated Arjuna's argument of sinful reactions by explaining Karmakanda philosophy, particularly text number 32, where Lord Krishna speaks about Swarga Dwaram Apavritam, Oparta. Happy are the Kshatriyas to whom such fighting opportunities come unsought, opening for them the doors of the heavenly planets. 
The Kshatriyas are happy to fight. They know. They can, if they die on the battlefield, they get heavenly planets. And if they win the battle, then they enjoy the kingdom. And then text number 33, we bring to your attention the text number 33 specifically defeats the argument of sinful reactions. Someone like to chant for us? Oh, we'll all chant, to, or you want all chant together? Tata Swadhanam Kirtim Cha Hitva Papam Avapsyasi. If, however, you do not perform your religious duty of fighting, then you will certainly incur sins for neglecting your duty and thus lose your reputation as a fighter. Now Arjuna had argued earlier that if he fought, he, would, he was worried about sinful reactions. But Lord Krishna is showing him just the opposite, that if you don't fight, you will certainly get sinful reactions, because you have not performed your duty, and you will lose your reputation as a fighter. Someone read? see Arjuna, Arjuna's thinking was totally wrong. Lord Krishna turned the whole thing around. A Prabhupada gives an example here about one king, Yasho Manta Singh. And Prabhupada explains either he conquers the battle or he lays down his body there dead. So the man who has come well, Prabhupada was telling the story about this Yashomanta Sain. The Yashomanta Sain was a king with an army and he'd gone to battle. Now after the battle, somehow he came home without any army anymore. And he came back to his palace and he asked the queen, open the doors, let me in, I'm your husband. And the queen said, you're my husband? What happened? Where's the army? Where, what happened to the bat in the battle? And the king said, yeah, we lost the battle, the, all my army defeated. I've come home, I've lost everything. So the queen said to the king that you cannot be my real husband. My real husband, either he wins the battle or he does not come home, he will die in the battle. So that is the Kshatriya mode, that is the spirit of the Kshatriya. So in this way the queen told the, the king that you, you must be some pretender, you're some imposter, so I'm not opening the door, you go away. She didn't open the door. So <laughs> this is the, the Kshatriya mode that they have to die on the battlefield rather than go home to feed. And they have to die going forward also. They have to fall on their face. They won't fall on their back. That would be very bad to die on the back. It's not good. They have to die going forward. This is the mood of the Kshatriya. And Prabhupada also talked about how in the past the kings of Jaipur they were given a sword and they had to go into the forest and kill a tiger or something before they could become the king. 
that was uh, that was expected of them. They had to show their courage. Uh, all right. So Prabhupada, that was Prabhupada lecturing two thirty three to thirty five, and then Krishna defeats Arjuna's argument of sinful reaction unfavorable way karmakanda people will always speak of your infamy and for a respectable person dishonor is worse than death that is chapter 2 text 34 so arjuna was saying that he wouldn't fight so Lord Krishna is telling him what will happen, that people will speak about you in a bad way. You will be dishonored. They will say you were a coward. They won't say you were a great soul and that's why you didn't fight. They say you were afraid and that will, that will be a very dishonorable for someone like Arjuna because Arjuna is a great Kshatriya. So he wants people should praise him, not criticize him. From text of 235, the great generals who have highly esteemed your name and fame will think that you have left the battlefield out of fear only, and thus they will consider you insignificant. Oh, that would be very painful for someone like Arjuna to be insignificant, to be considered insignificant. Because before, the great generals were appreciating even your name and fame. But now, because you've left the battlefield, oh, you've become insignificant. And then text 36, your enemies will describe you in many unkind words and scorn your ability. What could be more painful for you? In a very unfavorable way, right? <laughs> this is how Lord Krishna is challenging Arjuna's uh, argument about sinful reactions. Maharaj, I have one question here actually. Yes. All these three things are related to honor or dishonor, right? Yes. And honor or dishonor will bring, uh, bring probably in the third uh, sloka, I mean 36, what could be more painful? I mean, it is either painful or uh, you can enjoy. So is it not related to the enjoyment which Arjuna is looking for? Is it related to sinful reactions? Well, Arjuna's look, they're using the word enjoyment, but it could be also understood in relation to Krishna, that Arjuna's enjoyment is to please Krishna. But speaking about your enemies will describe you in many... So certainly for the enemies to mock, for them to mock Arjuna and to criticize him, then that will be very painful for Arjuna. Yes, Rishikesh Prabhu, you have raised your hand. Hare Krishna Prabhu, thank you. Just to comment on your question, from my previous notes, this is the fourth time I am endeavouring to do this course. The 2.33 in the Karamkanda section of these eight verses, 2.33, yes, does, uh, does point towards the refutation of fear of simple, simple reactions. That is correct. But the rest of the Paramkanda is only pointing towards enjoyment part, which Arjun had raised a doubt. I won't be able to enjoy. Well, uh, that, if, if, uh, uh, yeah, that is exactly what my question is actually. Whether it is simple reactions, no, then it is enjoyment, right? Yeah. Mm. Except for 2.33. Except 2.33. No, no, I'm not talking about 2.33, 2.34, 35 and 36 which Maharaj actually shown us. They're okay. all about enjoyment, right? Yeah, that is what I, my question is, uh, Maharaj. Yeah. Yes. All, all this first thing speaks about dishonor, 
second second thing speaks about name and fame the third thing speaks about painful react i mean pain yeah so it's enjoyment rather than sinful reaction does mention you will certainly incur sin for neglecting so it does talk of sin 33 bro right yes yeah yeah 33 yeah it is out of context for now at least okay thanks thanks bro for your inputs and we'll ask padna bro so 33 is about sins and yeah you i'm but enjoyment because people will speak of your infamy they'll speak about your your sin you know because it's sin not to fight you could just des describe it like that that arjuna going away from the battlefield that is sinful maharaj uh, my humble uh, idea is that it is already described in 33 and 34 35 36 krishna here uh, won't repeat right the same point again he says about dishonor name fame i mean we are very dealing in karma kan where in uh, induces someone to do something so krishna is inducing to fight based on his honor name fame and then pain aha uh -huh. that is how i understand this because uh it, already he spoke about sinful reactions okay that he specifically told that if you neglect i mean arjuna's idea is that if i fight it i will get sin but krishna clearly says that if you neglect then you will then only you will get uh, sinful reactions okay that is very clear there 34 35 36 probably is uh, on enjoyment is what i understand because the topic there says krishna defeats arjuna's arjuna's argument of sinful reaction Unfavorable way. That is why I was. All right. Question. So I, I mean, I can change that. These headings are put by us, you know. I mean, maybe it just I just added it on into into this slide. It's not. You're right. I we can, we can put it. The fifth Arjuna's argument of enjoyment. Yeah. Probably. Okay. Thanks, Maharaj, for that. And the last Padma, probably you have your hand raised. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes. Thank you for giving me time. Mara, Mara, I think both are correct. The point which you mentioned earlier and the PPT was the uh, handbook which we have received. I I am looking on that. So it mentions that karm kanda section that describe duties gain material enjoyment. This is the main heading that uh, this thirty one to thirty eight is covered under um, gain from material enjoyment. It means that um, uh, Krishna, Lord Krishna, is addressing. The concerns of enjoyment of Arjuna, that anyway he is going to get that. All right. And then, Mar and then, Maharaj, in the description, it is written uh, that thirty-two and thirty-seven speaks of the gain Arjuna would get by fighting, and verse thirty-three to thirty-six describes the losses he will incur by avoiding his duty. And Oh. So losses can be like sinful reaction, Maharaj, that he is going to get. So in my understanding, that both are correct here. Okay, can we just hear From, that? Can we just yes. hear that again? Thirty-two, thirty-one, thirty-one. Is was it thirty-one and thirty-seven, or thirty-two and thirty-seven? Thirty-two and thirty-seven. Thirty-two and thirty-seven speaks of the gains Arjuna would get by fighting, uh -huh. and verse thirty-three to thirty-six describe the losses he will incur by avoiding his duty. The losses he will incur by avoiding yes, his duty. Yes, certainly yes, that's true. Then These then are the losses, yes. but you're saying yes, that this, this is this is sinful reaction. Yes, ma'am. Well, I am interpreting it in that way. The losses can be uh, is, to, uh, is being presented in the form of sinful reaction. Yeah. What What the other proposers think about yeah. that? Did you hear that, Prabhu? And uh, Maharaj, I can read out for for you. Okay, I have taken the handbook now. Yeah. 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 So, so it is it is page twenty page. Yeah, the approach twenty. Your your voice is very actually. Your mic you should keep uh, some distance away from you. Page, it is 
it is page 20 from book you can read yeah yeah from there only you read maharaj the talk yes karma kanda by prescribed duties gain material enjoyment 31 to 38 after defeating arjuna's arguments for knowledge of the eternity of the soul krishna now takes a different approach even if arjuna identifies with his body by fighting as a kshatriya he will be happy Krishna thus refers to karma kanda teachings to primarily defeat Arjuna's second argument, enjoyment. Krishna explains that if Arjuna fights, he will find enjoyment, but if he doesn't, he will incur sinful reaction and infamy. Krishna also touches on Arjuna's other arguments, compassion and sinful reaction. Verses 32 and 37 speaks of the gains Arjuna would get by fighting, and verses 33 to 36 Describe the losses he will incur by avoiding his duty. This is what is there, Maharaj. Okay, thank you. All right, so I mean, I leave it up to you. You know how you like to interpret it. You may think of it as enjoyment. Someone else could see it as sinful reactions. It's certainly an unfavorable way. Yeah, that is that is sure, Maharaj. Yes. Okay, so we'll go ahead, and then Arjuna's. Uh, object, objection of indecision that here in text 37 because Arjuna was, he was thinking oh I don't know should I fight or should I not fight and so text 37 says either you will be killed on the battlefield and attain the heavenly planets or you will conquer and enjoy the earthly kingdom so, one way or another, die on the battlefield or else enjoy the kingdom. This is the argument to the indecision of Arjuna, that you have to do something. All right. So here we have another heading here, the transition from Sakama Karma Yoga to Niskam Karma Yoga. So from, de from attached work to detached work. Text number 38. Sukha Dukhe Same Kritva Laba Labo Jaya Jayo Tato Yudhaya Yajyasva Naivam Papam Avabhyasi and then the translation do thou fight for the sake of fighting without considering happiness or distress loss or gain victory or defeat and by so doing you shall never incur sin so lord krishna is speaking to arjuna encouraging him to do this battle, to fight this battle in a, a very detached manner. You can see, without considering the results. Don't be attached to the result. Just simply do your duty and that way you'll never get any sinful reactions. Fight for the sake of fighting. As a Kshatriya, he will enjoy fighting. Prabhupada's lecture, chapter 2, texts 27 and 28. This is duty. One has to execute duty without any consideration of loss and gain. That is duty, observing duty. Just see, you are Kshatriya. There is necessity of this fighting. So you should not consider whether you are gaining or losing. It is your duty to fight. If you execute your duty nicely, there is no question of sin. So this is very nice. No question of sin. Arjuna was worried about sinful reaction. But if he just simply does his duty, and this is important for all of us. Karma yoga means detached work and freedom from sinful reactions. So 
So Lord Krishna has defeated the compassion of Arjuna by giving knowledge of the soul. And now by giving the Karmakanda knowledge, Lord Krishna has defeated these other arguments of Arjuna. Specifically, enjoyment, sinful reaction and indecision. Coming back to this verse again, it's mentioned here. Sama means equanimity, being unchanged in all circumstances. That means that one remains the same person in glory or infamy, opulence or poverty. We can understand that's a very demanding quality, a very you have to be a very great character to be able to have that kind of equanimity. Sometimes we see people lose all their money and they become poverty stricken. They commit suicide. They cannot tolerate. It's unbearable to them. And when people lose something, when they, they get a bad name, they feel so, so ashamed. It's unbearable. And at the same time, when they are victorious, when they get glory, there's, it goes to their head, they're so proud. But we're told we should be unchanged in all circumstances. That is karma yoga. So to come to that platform requires control of the mind and senses. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur said, you will not incur sin as long as you are endowed with this equanimity. This is also described later in Bhagavad Gita 5.10. Lipyate na sapape na padma patram ivambasa. One becomes sinful or bound by action if he is attached to the fruit of his actions. So of course this is the problem that when we act we're all attached to the fruit. We're very much concerned with the fruits of our action. No one, not one of us will act without considering the fruits. You're not going to take a job without knowing how much they're going to pay you. <laughs> very difficult to be detached from the fruit. Srila Prabhupada's purport brings this verse to the level of bhakti. So from Niskam Karma Yoga to bhakti. Lord Krishna now directly says that Arjuna should fight for the sake of fighting because he desires the battle. There is no consideration of happiness or distress, profit or gain, victory or defeat in the activities of Krishna consciousness. That everything should be performed for the sake of Krishna is transcendental consciousness. So there is no reaction to material activity. So Srila Prabhupada brings us to Krishna Consciousness. In Krishna Consciousness, there's no question of victory or defeat. It's simply service to Krishna. Very important. When you go out for preaching, that's success. There's no failure in Krishna Consciousness. But Prabhupada said, there's no victory either. It's simply service. We're doing our service for Krishna. Don't be attached. Don't be proud of the anything. Just simply perform our duty. All right? So, main points what we covered here today. We spoke about the process of transmigration. Text 22. Who remembers the verse? Text 22. Yes, 
Maharaj. Without looking at the book, do you remember? Two yes, 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 Maharaj. Quote it then. Yes, we, we always need to revise our slokas, you know. It's good to recite them again and again. All right, then we explained also that there are two types of swadharma. What are the two types? In the material conception and in the spiritual conception, once we are liberated from that. Or we could say of conditioned and liberated, right. Two types, conditioned, a conditioned uh, version of swadharma is approached by following Varnashra. And on the liberated platform, then you don't need to follow Varnashra. The practical approach to following Varnashra dharma according to our position. According to our position, we have to act accordingly. Different ashrams, different varnas, so we should act. And then appropriate and inappropriate application of violence. Inappropriate application of violence. Yeah, you somebody attacks you so you fight you 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 arrange to beat him up to retaliate that's not our principle a devotee gets attacked he has he should tolerate but somebody standing nearby should not tolerate and they should come and defend you if some if you see somebody being attacked you should go and help him and defend him if you see a devotee being attacked it's our duty to go forward and try to help him. But if somebody attacks us, we should tolerate. Is this why we have to be in association always, Maharaj? Yes, a good idea. <laughs> if you're in association, you're less likely to be attacked. All right, appropriate and inappropriate. The, the, utilize, the utility of violence a mother and father is not allowed to beat the child anymore, right? The child can call the police. My mother's butt beating me, please come. And the mother can get in trouble. So violence is uh, something which has to be used very carefully and only as a last resort. current issues of religious violence. Well, c tension between people of different faiths, right? As we heard in Bangladesh, there was some problem. In many parts of the world, we get something, just like in, in, in the UK, in Ireland, for many years, there was conflicts between the Catholic and the Protestant. Southern Ireland was Catholic and Northern Ireland was Protestant and there was constant battling between the two. So religious violence, it's a history of the world, practically all the wars in the world, some kind of religious violence involved. Then the spirit of the Kshatriya, we heard about uh, Sumantha saying that he went home, but he went home defeated. And so the queen would not let him in. She said, go away, you must be an imposter. You cannot be my husband. My husband dies on the battlefield or he wins the battle. He doesn't come home defeated. So that is the Kshatriya mood. And then 
Krishna's defeated Arjuna's argument such as fear from sinful reaction. He defeated that by describing karma yoga. How did Krishna defeat Arjuna's argument about enjoyment? Karma karma. Can you tell me more? What do you mean? Just it's supposed to do karma kanda? No, rather if you fight, you will get the uh, and if you win, you will get the uh, kingdom. If not, you will go to heavenly planets. That is one way. Yeah, uh, he discussed the gains and losses. Right, the gains and losses. If he fights, if he wins the battle, then what will happen? He may enjoy the kingdom. Yeah, and if he loses the battle, what will happen? He will go to heavenly planets. Yeah, like because that. he's going to die on the battlefield. And what will happen if he doesn't fight? He will incur sinful reactions. In what way? Because he is neglecting his duty. Actually. No. What, the, what will happen to his enjoyment if he doesn't fight? Infamy. Infamy. 